I'm from the house over in Snohomish. It's my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce the speaker. It's DJ Rabe, my pastor. You know, one of the interesting things about DJ is that it uh, doesn't matter where you're at. You could be in uh, Everett on the street. You can be in Uganda with him, and he's going to be the same person. Sometimes that's interesting. But uh, nonetheless, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, a, a, it's a pleasure being in, uh, uh, you know, at, at his church. He uh, started ministry in 99 officially. And um, his, uh, he's in ministry with his uh, lovely wife, Dottie. Uh, they're an amazing couple. A lot of fun to be around. And, uh, you know, it, it's, as I mentioned, whether it's in downtown Everett, whether it's uh, uh, a skate park, you know, whether it's uh, just trying to talk to somebody either on the phone or online, you know, DJ is ready for, for uh, a word, you know, with them. And that's, uh, that's really refreshing. And so uh, I'm not going to make this long. I'm just going to introduce DJ Rabe. How, uh, wow, wow. What's that? Yeah, we like, we like sports. Um, how goes the battle? No, I'm serious. How goes the battle? Are you winning? How goes the battle at home? How goes the battle at your job? You guys aren't in a battle? You guys sound like you're not in a battle. The last time I spoke on spiritual warfare, shortly after that, I was arrested. We were in uh, Kampala, Uganda. I was there with my 17-year-old daughter, and I preached for darn near three hours on what it meant by spiritual warfare. That was Sunday morning. Monday morning, I just took a break and went out to the largest market in Kampala, just to shop, and we were apprehended by uh, two... Um, they call them officers, but they're in full fatigues, they're in ARs, they're in AK, they're holding AKs and ARs. This is a very different environment from what we're accustomed to here in America. We were detained, I don't know how long it was, but um, it was very foreign to me. I was in a situation I had never been before, never been in before. It was very uncomfortable for my 17-year-old daughter. And so we're in this little box and there's a cage or a jail uh, back behind us here. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was about to happen. All I could do is realize that I'm in a test. All I could do is realize that I just got done preaching for three hours about spiritual warfare and now is my opportunity to live it out. And I didn't know what I was going to do, you know. Maybe some of you super spiritual guys, you would have known what to do. I didn't know what to do. So you know what I did? I decided what wasn't going to happen. Because I didn't know what was going to happen. So I made a decision what wasn't going to happen. I stood. I stood for some things. Number one, we're not going to get separated. Me and my daughter are not getting separated, period. Number two, none of us, none of us are going in that cage. None of us are going in that jail. Thirdly, uh, I'm not giving any of these guys one shilling because I know what this is about. This is about extortion. I didn't know what else to do, guys. You just have to sometimes decide what you're not going to do. And needless to say, you know, um, we got out of there. We got out of there. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, 
it, it was, uh, like I said, it was quite the environment. I had never been in this environment before. And so I turned to the pastor that was apprehended with us and I said, hey, um, why don't we just call the embassy? You know, because see, I started to realize something. I started to realize I'm a believer. I'm a Christian, number one. Number two, I'm an American. Okay, so I don't really think I need to be putting up with this. So, you know, finally over about two or three times, I said over and over, let's just call the embassy. Can we just call the embassy? I mean, I don't know much about this, but I'm pretty sure there is one. And they're to be used for situations like this. And this is what the pastor said. He said, um, as a last resort. I turned to him and I said, uh, I don't know what is a last resort in your eyes. <laughs> but in my dictionary, I look up last resort, this is it. <laughs> we got out of there. I did my best to witness to the, the, the oldest militant. <laughs> and uh, it, it just, it was a great story. But I'm going to tell you what, you will have the opportunity to live out what you preach. You will. It's not just about talking. It's about living it out. Let's turn to our main text. We're going to look at um, Ephesians 6. Verse 10 through 17. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It says this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We're going to start this morning by, or this morning, this evening by asking a simple question. Whose armor are we talking about? God's armor. It's okay to talk. <laughs> I like interactive meetings. I don't ask a lot of rhetorical questions like, are you out there? Because I already know you're out there. Can you hear me? I know you can hear me because I have the microphone. We're talking about God's armor. Now, that's a real simple question, but the answer is very, very significant. Look at verse 11. Is it up there? No? Well, look at it, look at it in your Bible. Verse 11. What's it say? Put on all of God's armor. Now, look at verse 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. Now look at 14. Stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the body of armor of God's righteousness. This is God's armor we're talking about. And uh, the reason why I, I want to clarify that is because too many Christians are talking about this armor as if it's theirs. And that's why they're having a lot of problems. That's why their life is going up and down and up and down. That's why we hear a lot of talk about, oh, I got a, a hole in my armor. What do you mean a hole in your armor? What armor are you referring to? You're surely not referring to this armor. Because it's not your armor. This is God's armor that we're talking about. I've heard a lot of Christians referring to this passage of Scripture. Referring to... Uh, referencing this passage of scripture 
talking about having or getting or, or trying to prevent uh, from getting a hole in their armor. Problem is, it's not their armor. The armor we're talking about tonight is God's armor. The armor that you're looking at in Ephesians 6, God's armor. Are we clear? Good. Just building a little foundation here. Okay, now let me ask another question to continue building this foundation. Would there be any holes in God's armor? You sure? How sure are you? Now, to define sure, people say I'm 99% sure. That's not sure. So what I'm asking you is how sure are you? 100% sure. Okay. Are there holes in, let me ask it another way. Are there holes in God's truth? Are there Holes in God's righteousness? Are there holes in God's peace or God's gospel? Are, are there holes in the faith that comes from God? Mm -mm. Are there holes in God's salvation? Mm -mm. Are there holes in the word of God? Mm -mm. No, there isn't. So, I like to ask a lot of questions if you haven't noticed. Let me ask you another one. What is the purpose of God's armor? Protection. What else? To stand, huh? To prepare us for battle? Good, man. It's a sharp group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that we will be able to to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. That's what it says. And we just established there's no holes in God's word. So it is what it is. So that we, look at, look at what it says, so that we. Do you see that? So that we will be able to stand. See, I find it very interesting. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. But I find it very interesting that the purpose of God's armor is so that we. The purpose of his armor is so that we. God just never stops giving. Never stops protecting. Never stops providing. The purpose, the reason for this armor is so that we. So that we what? Look at verse 11. So that we will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. Verse 13. I'm changing the word you to we. So that we will be able to, what? Resist the enemy. Verse 16. In the New King James it says this. You will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now notice it doesn't say so that we might be able to. Notice that it doesn't say that we should be able to. And notice that it doesn't say that we would be able to if... Excuses, excuses, excuses. Man, we got so many excuses. How many of you like to win? I know we live in a culture that doesn't keep score anymore. Everybody gets a trophy now. But I believe that winning builds character too. You like to win? Yeah. I like to win. How many of you would rather win than lose? Yeah. Oh. 
Well, you know. No. No. We're wired to win. And, and God has provided us what it takes, what we need to win. And there's not a situation that goes outside of that. Although we try to pretend there is. We try to pretend our sad story is just something that God just can't figure out. Yeah, but if you only knew my situation, yeah, you know, I tried that. Whatever. I got great news for you if you like to win. The great news is you will be able to. The great news is you will be able to stand firm. The great news is you will be able to resist. You will be able to stand your ground. You will be able to be fully prepared. You will be able to stop the enemy's fiery darts. You will. See, it's not in the character of God to tell us something to do that we can't do. That's not his character. I don't tell my son to take out the trash... Because I don't think he has the ability to take out the trash. (laughs) If we weren't able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil, then God wouldn't have said that we will be able to. And we've already established that there's no holes in God's word. See, that's why I ask you if you're sure. Because see, once you take a position, once you take a position, the next thing to do is to stand. And not waver. Jesus said this in John 6, 33. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. I'm going to encourage you uh, tonight. Just because you didn't stand last time. You didn't resist last time. You weren't prepared last time. It doesn't mean that you can't stand next time. And you can't resist next time. And you can't be prepared next time. And the next time after that. And the next time after that. And the next time after that. It says take heart. Jesus says, take heart. Take heart means to be confident or courageous in a difficult situation. So you don't need to take heart when everything's easy. Take heart. You can overcome that which is trying to overtake you. Take heart. That's what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, he says, take heart. What does he mean? Don't freak out. Don't become restless, but rest in the reality that greater is he in you than he that is in the world. Take rest in the reality of that. Because the only other alternative is restlessness, stress, freaking out, wavering back and forth, double-mindedness. Now, quick overview before we really strap on the seatbelts. We're talking about God's armor, yeah? There's no, har- there's no holes in God's armor, right? And the purpose of God's armor is so that we will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Are we still clear? We're all in that position together still? Okay. I mean, then, then if we're there, if that's what we really believe, then who in the world would not want to put this armor on? Who wouldn't want to have this armor on? Which leads me to the fun part of this message. I need a couple volunteers. Because we're going to put some armor on. 
No, really, I need a couple volunteers, okay? Okay, you in the glasses and you in the, in the blue shirt. Yeah, I'll call it blue. Blue shirt. Yeah. Now, um, no, 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 Where, where's the guy in the glasses? Come on. Okay, come on, now we don't, I, I'm limited here. I'm really limited. Oh my gosh, I'm really limited. You got to hurry up, man. We don't have much time. That's how much time I have? Okay, I'm better than I thought I was. Okay, I need you to get that stuff out of there and put it on him. All right, now, what's your name? My name is Daniel. Daniel, I'm DJ. It's good to meet you. Okay, now, as Daniel's putting on this armor, I want you to think about the description of this armor. Ephesians 6, verse 14 through 17 says that we put on a belt of truth, we put on a breastplate of righteousness, we put on shoes of peace, we put on or we take up a shield of faith, we put on a helmet of salvation, and we take up a sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, some of you super spiritual people, you're going to freak out, you're like, that's not how it was, these messing with the Bible. Well, I'll help you out, I'll help you out, I'll help you out before the night's through. Um... But here's what I want you to notice. You notice all the elements in the armor of God, right? As it's listed in Ephesians 6. Now, did you notice this? You probably did because you're a really bright group. Did you notice that not only are there six different elements there or, or things that you either take up or put on, but they are described as a complete set? Did you see that? Now, don't worry, if, again, if you're freaking out, look at Eve has one of these little wiener, <laughs> even has a wiener shield, man. I don't know if they had those back 2,000 years ago. All right. Now, you notice that God's armor is described as a complete set. That means this. That means it's expected to be worn as a complete set. And it also means this, that it's only 100% effective if it is worn as a complete set. Look at verse 11. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Verse 13. Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Now, let's do an armor check. Okay? Does he have every piece, I mean, you know, within reason? We know it doesn't look exactly like the proverbial picture of the Roman soldier, okay? Uh, but does he have every piece on? He's got some shoes, he's got a belt, he's got a breastplate, if that's what you want to call it. A helmet, surely he's got a helmet. A sword, a shield. Now, here's my question. Does he look, doesn't he look a lot more spiritual than he did when he first came in here tonight? <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> Uh, now that he's wearing his body armor, his, his armor of God, doesn't he look much more spiritually prepared for battle? For a spiritual battle? No, he doesn't. He looks kind of goofy, actually. The reason why he can put this armor on, and even if it did, it looked, even if it did, it looked, ex it, it was complete replica of the Roman centurion soldier's army and what they wore. Even if it was completely identical, he still wouldn't look any more spiritual. You know why? Because this isn't the real armor. That's why. How in the world is putting on a helmet, a breastplate, a belt, some sandals, taking up a shield and a sword, 
going to help us overcome the spiritual battles that we face. Do you remember what it said in verse 12? In, in Ephesians 6, 12, it makes it perfectly clear without a shadow of a doubt that we are talking about a spiritual battle, not a natural one. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Wearing a belt, breastplate, shoes, helmet, holding a shield, holding a sword, are not going to help us in a spiritual battle. We need to be very careful, guys, about getting caught up and swept away by the outward symbolism. The armor that he's wearing is the armor that covers up the man. It's the armor that is seen. It's the armor that is on the outside of a man. It's the armor that is temporal. It's the armor that is handcrafted or man-made. And therefore, it's not going to protect a man in a spiritual battle. Now let's Look at the real armor. Go ahead and take this off. The real armor is what I want to talk about. Truth. Righteousness. Peace. Faith. Salvation. The word of God. This is the real armor. This is the, this is the armor of God. And how do I know that? Because this is the armor that doesn't cover the man. This is the armor that consumes the man. This isn't the seen armor. This is the unseen armor. This is the armor on the inside of the man. This is the armor that is eternal. This is the armor that is crafted by the very heart of God. That's how I know it's the real armor. And it ought to be the armor we're talking about. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In Luke 17, verse 20 to 21, it says, Jesus said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. And it also says that the kingdom of God is within you. Not upon you. Within you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So is the kingdom of God within you? You've seen the old Gatorade commercials, huh? Is it in you? Is the kingdom of God within you? Are truth, righteousness, peace, the gospel, faith, salvation? If it ain't, I'm miserable. <laughs> Is God's word within you? I believe it is. And if it is, then you have on, or rather, are in the full armor of God. See, I just want to, I want you to just make a little shift tonight. Rather than seeing the armor on you rather than seeing it as putting on the armor I want you to see it as you being in the armor 
Just a little bit of difference, but it's a little difference that will make a big impact in the way you live your life. Now, man, thanks so much for putting all this away, but I got to have one piece because I'm supposed to be talking about this piece here, this breastplate. This piece, this is my assignment tonight. This breastplate. It's actually a catcher's vest. But it's, a, it's our breastplate tonight. No Roman soldier would ever go out to battle without their breastplate on. It was often made of leather and then it would have overlapping pieces of steel metal molded shaped to conform to the body of the soldier what's interesting is just as a side note that leather would be regularly oiled which I believe speaks Clearly of the Holy Spirit. If you're into symbolism. The breastplate would protect a soldier's, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, breast. Or chest rather. Okay? We're all men here. We, we say chest. In the chest are vital organs, including the most vital organ of all, the heart. If a soldier went out to battle without this, an enemy's arrow would easily pierce his heart. The most important job of the breastplate is to protect or guard the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this. Above all else, guard your heart. For out of it, what? The heart. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Wearing or putting on the breastplate of righteousness simply means to guard your heart. Protect your heart. Biblically, the word heart means the most inner being of a man. So note this, the breastplate of righteousness was made by the very heart of God to protect the very heart of man. That's raw. I like that. If I had a pen, I would have wrote that down. But I have an iPad that's already written down. God examines the heart of man. Not simply his outward appearance or, or what he appears to be. I mean, the Bible speaks a lot about people that appear to be saying and doing all the right things on the outside, but their hearts are far from God. In our heart, we all battle fear. In our heart, we all battle doubt and worry and insecurity and pride and guilt and shame and unforgiveness and the motivation to sin. We all fight this battle in our heart. In the innermost part of who we are, that's where the battle is raging. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Guarding our heart with righteousness. Having the breastplate of righteousness on. What does it all mean? Well, just as the Romans breastplate would protect the heart, the righteousness of God. 
protects our spiritual heart. Just as heart disease, (laughs) no kidding, just as heart disease is the number one killer in America. It's the number one cause of physical death in America. In, In the same way, not having a surrendered heart to God is the number one cause, always will be the number one cause of spiritual death. Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians or look up on the screen there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. In the New King James it says this. I'm going to read it in New Living too because I want you to see something. In the New King James, it says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin. For us. What's the purpose of the armor of God? So that we. What's the purpose of sin in Jesus? So that we. So that we what? Could become. Become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. Now look at it in New Living. Because in in the New King James it says become the righteousness of God in him. Um, But in the New Living Translation that's translated be made right with God through Christ. So what is the being made the righteousness of God? What does this mean? It means to be made right with God. In Christ. How is our heart made right with God? Listen to this. Never forget this. Write this down. Memorize this. Romans 3 verse 22. Listen to this. How is your heart made right with God? I would not dare leave having said all that I said and not say this. Because I don't like a bunch of people telling me all this stuff about the Bible and not telling me how to apply it. I don't like all these people trying to give me all this information and, and walk away with a whole bunch of information but not be inspired by God. I'm tired of that. Something I can use. This is all cute and everything for, you know, object lessons and illustrations, but give me something that I can use. I'm going to give you something you can use. We are made right with God by placing Our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true, watch this, this is true for everyone who believes. No matter who you are. Well, I'm supposed to howl? Really? It says howl at the end of the timer. Let's stand. I guess we're supposed to howl. Let's stand. Okay, everybody howl. I don't know. It said howl. I'm just, I'm just being obedient. I could have unless my eyes are failing. It said howl. Okay. There you go. That's that's a how. Listen, guys. Um, 
I want to leave you with a series of, of questions. And, uh, and, and, and I, I pray that you go back to these discussion groups, these, um, these breakout groups, and, and, and you really get after some stuff. You really get honest with God. You get honest with yourself. And you get honest with one another. Now, I want everybody to close their eyes for a moment. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions. And you're going to know the answer to these questions. I don't. You do. And whatever you answer to these questions, I want you to deal with it. And I believe that you have what you need to deal with it. Because of our time here tonight. You know what to do. Question number one. Have you ever questioned what you believed to be true? Question number two. Has fear ever begun to threaten your peace? Have you ever felt unguarded? Have you ever felt unprotected? Have you ever felt disoriented? Have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt unarmed? Have you ever felt unsafe? Have you ever questioned your salvation? Guys, if you answered yes to any of those, those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of not having this on. But you know what? You've seen symptoms before. And I don't think that you in this room are going to allow symptoms to scare you away and to scare you off. I think you're not about running away from the battle. I think you're just the men that are going to run to it. Oh, I know we have a choice. We have a choice. Number one, engage. Oh my goodness, that's tough. I don't know if I want to do that. Number two, escape. There you go. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're stirring these men's heart. Rocking them to the very core of who they are. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it's still working in spite of what we see, your kingdom is within us. Thank you, God, that it's working in us tonight. And it will be working in us tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Because we will stand. Amen. Amen. Amen.